Hey, so uh, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and, and this is really cool because um, we're in my, my, I have my small group, and I hope your small group's going well. We have uh, small groups for every time we do a talk, we're beginning to have small groups that go along with that series, and right now we're in a series on Ecclesiastes, if you're here for the first time, and we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 tonight, and uh, so we're in my small group this past uh, Monday night, and we're talking about things, and I just, I just simply said... I said, so what do you guys think of this so far? And they're all like, dude, this is the most depressing book I've ever read. <laughs> Hopefully you guys don't feel that way. Maybe I'm thinking that it's just my small group and I just naturally make things depressing. But uh, hopefully you don't feel that way. Hopefully, um, because here, here's the truth. I want to redirect you because many times that is the view of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is this book and over and over and over this old guy says, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And then he goes into this whole barrage of what he thinks is meaningless. And uh, pretty much so far, everything is meaningless, right? And uh, so we were talking about that. And really what this book is about, and it turned last week in chapter 3. What he's really saying is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless is life without God. And that in the beginning of chapter 4, he, or at the end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, he, he goes into this thing, and we're not going to cover it tonight, but I think it's a good thing to cover and to talk about. He talks about, he says, really meaningless, meaningless, meaningless is life without God. And that basically life without God, we're no different than animals. And, and that is the difference between animals and people that God has placed in himself in people for those who accept him and that makes all the difference in the world that in itself is huge and then he goes into chapter um four he starts talking about friendships and so real quick i want you to think about where did you meet your best well first who is your best friend who's your best friend just think about that who's your best friend maybe you look over and go yeah you're my best friend and they'll go well you're not mine that would be a bad thing, right? And now some of you guys are sitting there thinking, well, I wonder if I'm their best friend. Well, they're my best friend, but if I'm not their best friend, then, then they're not my best friend because I'm not playing that game, man. I only have room for one friend in my life. And then, then where did you meet your best friend? When I was in high school, you know where I met my best friend? We got in a fight. We got in like a full fist cuff, just beat each other up fight. And then pretty soon we were like, Hey, dude, you're kind of a cool guy. And we became friends because we beat each other up. And that's the way guys work. Guys can beat each other up. They can do this whole thing where they beat each other up, and they're like, hey, man, you're cool. And then you go hang out, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like, guys do this. Girls don't do this. Guys, girl, you never see girls just walk up and just punch another girl just to say, hey, I like you. <laughs> that does not happen. If that happens, that is only a chick fight. That's how that whole thing works. But guys just like lay one on. Jake and I will sometimes be walking through the office and he'll just about knock me out. Jake's one of my best friends. And he'll just about knock me out. And the harder he hits me, the cooler I think he is. <laughs> and I don't know why guys do this kind of thing, but it's just true. And so, where did you meet your best friend? What was it that sealed your friendship? I, that is one of my favorite stories. The story is about two guys because friends... If you have a really good friend, you know that you can call them and they'll do anything for you, right? I mean, that's a friend. A friend is, is the type of person that when, when you're in real need, when, when your life's in the toilet, you have that person that you can call. And anybody that doesn't fit that category is probably just an associate, is probably just, just kind of a, a relationship. Anybody that doesn't fit that category where you say, you know, when I know the chips are down, I can call this guy because that's a friend. One of my favorite stories is about these two guys that they were up here um, climbing the monument. They were going to go climb the monument, a, a bunch of climbing guys. And as they're walking up this trail, this snake reaches out and bites the first guy. Bites him right on the keister. He's like, immediately he drops down, and the guy's like, what, 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 what? He said, that, that rattlesnake just bit me. And he looks over, and there's this rattlesnake, and it's slithering off. And he, got, he goes, hold on, hold on, I, I know what I can do. There is a doctor that I saw down in the station. I'll be right back. It won't be long. I'll be right back. And he runs back to the station. And he says, he says hey, he finds the doctor. He says, hey, my friend just got bit by a rattlesnake. I need you to come. He goes, I, I can't. 
we've got an emergency. We have somebody fall off a cliff over here, and I have got to be up there, but I can tell you what to do. I can tell you what to do. Here's what you do. You have got to suck the poison out of the snake bite. It's like, what? If you've got to suck the poison out of the snake bite, and you only have minutes to do it because once the poison hits the bloodstream, it's going to go directly to the heart, and once it goes to the heart, your friend is going to die. This is very serious. He goes, okay, Doc. He runs back, back up the hill, back up the hill, finds his buddy, and as he finds his buddy, his buddy is, is fading in and out, in and out, and he says, hey, did you find the Doc? He says, yeah, I, I found the Doc. He said, what did he say? He looks over at him and says, he said, you're going to die. You are going to die. All right. That's not a good friend. But I love this in Ecclesiastes because he's talking about friendships. If you flip over to Ecclesiastes 4, we're going to read verses 7 through 16. It's going to be on the overheads. And I always encourage you to bring your Bible. As a matter of fact, if you're here tonight and you do not own a Bible, okay, this is the, this is the premise on this. If you do not own a Bible, I've got one. I'll, I'll, I'll get one for you, and we will get you a Bible. You just come talk to me and say, hey, Paul, you know what? I would love to have a Bible. I don't have a Bible. I'll get you one, okay? So anyway, I encourage you, if you have a Bible, please bring it and read, because here's how it works for me. I know that God speaks to me in church. I he speaks to me all over the places, but when I'm in church, and, and for me it's weekends, and I'm sitting down here, and I'll be over here, and all of a sudden the pastor will speak something in his message, and all of a sudden God will dial in on me, and he may, he, he may take me a whole different route than what God is speaking through him. All of a sudden the pastor will say something, and all of a sudden go, oh, that's what I'm going through. But it'll take a whole different direction. And you need to have your Bible so that you can highlight that and mark that and write in there because God does speak. And that he speaks through his word. And then there's times where you're in church and maybe, maybe nothing is really ringing a bell, but there's times where you'll hear a scripture. I was in um, 201 this week. We, I was teaching 201. And Ronnie um, was teaching on worship. And he quotes this scripture in 2 Samuel 24:24. 24, 24 that just simply says what happens is David has come and, and God's blessed him. And David has come to the priest and the priest has said, listen, you can use whatever you want to to sacrifice and make a blessing to God. And David turns back to him and the priest says, and it's free. We won't charge you a thing. This is free. This is just us opening the church to you. And David turns. And this is not where Ronnie was going with it, but man, God busted me on it. And, and David turns and he turns to the priest and he says, no, I will never make a sacrifice to God that doesn't cost me something. And what he's saying is this, I am not going to take this thing lightly. I'm going to give God all of me and I'm going to sacrifice all of me and I'm gonna, I, I, want, I want God to know that I'm in fully. And I wrote that down and I've probably written that down 10 times this week. And so I know that God speaks. So bring your Bibles um, so you can take notes and... Uh, let God speak to you, okay? So here we go. This is what Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 16 says. It says, I observed yet another example of meaningless in our world. So if you've been following with this, he's talked about all these meaningless things. And then he says, and here's one more. This is the case of a man who is all alone. And for some of you, as I start this, you go, oh, this is not going to be a good talk. This is going to be talk on loneliness. We're going to touch on it. It says, The case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet he works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, Who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It's all so meaningless and depressing. I, I think that's true. I think, I think that we're going to stop right there for just a second. I think that... Maybe you've experienced this. I know that I've experienced this. Where, man, I work, 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 work. And then I go home and there's no one home because my family's off doing something else. And I think to myself, what am I doing? Why am I killing myself? What, what, what is this all about? And that, that sometimes you can get into this position where you will spend so much time doing things for others that all of a sudden it'll slide you into a depression. And you wonder, what am, what am I really doing? And that's what he's saying. Then he says that two people 
can accomplish more than twice as much as one. They get a better return for their labor. If a person falls, the other can reach out and help. That's important. Underline that. If a person falls, the other can reach out and help. Now catch this. But people who are alone, when they fall, are in real trouble. That, that's huge. You want to underline that. He's, they're just saying that when people who are by themselves, when they fall, they're in real trouble. Have you not seen that commercial where that lady falls and she can't get up? That was funny. Sorry. You guys don't have a good sense of humor. And on a cold night, two under the same blanket can gain warmth from each other. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And the very first thing that Solomon is saying is he's saying this. This is the very first revelation that he's, that he's given these young guys. He says, loneliness is one of the greatest vanities known to mankind. That, that, that in all of mankind, in all of the things that happens, one of the greatest vanities is loneliness. This is the case of a man who is all alone. One of the greatest vanities in the world is to be all alone. And here's what happens when you're all alone. Loneliness makes you question yourself, right? When you're all alone, there's these thoughts that go off in your head, and it's like, man, dude, why doesn't anybody like me? What's wrong with me? And so you begin to think through this process of what, what, what's going on with me? Why is it that I can't seem to make connections with people? And all of a sudden, depression kicks in. And when he says this is depressing, what happens is he's not just saying this is depressing. What he's saying is that loneliness leads to depression. And then all of a sudden you're saying, how, how does this whole thing work? Why am I all alone? Why can't I make a friend? And then you turn from thinking, why can't I make friends? Why can't somebody like me? Then you begin to question God. Have you ever did that? Have you been home on like a Friday night or, or maybe you, 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 you used to have some great friends and now you don't have any great friends and all of a sudden you're just like, God, what's up with this, dude? Come on, I pray for friends all the time. Why, why can't I just have one friend? Come on, God. And then you begin to take this thing and you begin to blame God. And you're like, well, God, this is your fault, man. You need to do something about this. And it makes you crazy. And the reason that being alone is such a great vanity Here's the reason. Here's why it's meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Because God didn't create us that way. That's why it's meaningless. That's why being alone is one of the greatest vanities in the world. Because God didn't create us that way. We were built for relationships. There's something about it. When you connect with somebody and you, go, you walk away and you're like, hey, dude, I think me and him are going to become great friends. And there's automatically this thing inside you that goes, this is going to be cool. And relationships, we're built for them. Genesis 2.18, second chapter in the Bible, says that God looked down at Adam's plight. And he said, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm looking at Adam, and there's all these animals, and there's two of all of those guys. And I'm looking down at Adam, and here's what I'm thinking. This is God. This tells us the thoughts of God. Second chapter, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And, and in this particular case, he's talking about a relationship, and he makes a woman for the man. And all of a sudden... Adam looks over and goes, whoa, man, that's awesome. And then the, now we got women, right? That was funny too. You guys are a tough crowd. But we're meant for each other. And you know what? It starts at an early age. I've got our small group over. We had a Super Bowl party, with, uh, had friends over. Um, and as we had some friends over, it was really funny because one of, our, the, one of, one of my friends has a little girl. And, and her, she's four years of age. And I had my brother over and, and his, his wife and his kids. And all of a sudden, his son, Ebi, is on the bed. And they're just kind of kicking that because we only have one room for us to watch TV in. And I've got another TV in our bedroom. And so the kids were in there watching movies. And Ebi's like this. He's eight because Ebi's cool. And he's sitting here. And all of a sudden, this little girl shoulders up right here. <laughs> He's like, uh-oh, this is a problem. This is kind of weird. She's thinking 
she has found the relationship she's looking for, right? Because that is what four-year-old girls think. Four-year-old girls start thinking about relationships. They see girls in dresses and marriage and all that, and they're thinking, yeah, I was designed for a relationship. Eight-year-old boys don't even have a clue. And can I tell you a secret? 28-year-old boys don't have a clue. And we're just like, yeah, let's get married. Yeah, it's good. And they're like, do you want to get married? Sure, that's good. You know? And, and, and girls think about this thing the whole time, but they're built for relationships. Why? Because God said it's not good to be alone. But catch this. The reason that loneliness is such a great vanity, the reason that loneliness is meaningless is because it's something that you can do something about. Loneliness is something you can do something about. And that's why Solomon's looking back and he's saying, guys, friendships are important. You see, everybody goes through times of being lonely. Everybody has them. And when you think that, that you're the only one that goes through this, it's, it's just not true. It's a lie from the enemy. Everybody has times of loneliness. But can I say something? And can I just be honest? Can I be a little bit bold here? If you have had years of loneliness, you are choosing loneliness. Because everybody has times of loneliness. But when you go years in loneliness, you're choosing it. And you got to break that cycle in your life. And here's why I say that. And you say, well, Paul, that's just not true. Well, wait a second. There's over 6 billion people on the planet. Here's how it works. You see, Proverbs says, if you want friends, you must show yourself friendly. A few years ago, and, he, and, and, and so you know, I'm not making this bold statement like, Pastor Paul, and what does he know? I'm telling you, about two or three years ago, I found my, a place in my life. And I had gone through probably three years where I had friends. But I kept going, God, I just, just give me one good friend. And I went through that period where, where, that, that, that period where it was, you know, okay, all right, what's wrong with me? Why, why can't I make that connection? And then all of a sudden, I went through this period where, okay, God, I just, God, I just need one friend. And I had a friend tell me, just pull me aside one day we're talking about this conversation. And this was a low moment for me. And he just said, listen, he says, if you want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. I said, yeah, but I'm a friendly guy. And he said, but being a friendly guy doesn't make friends. He says, you've got to build relationships. Here's how you build a relationship. You throw parties. <laughs> you throw regular parties. You, on a regular basis, just say, you know what? This isn't in your court. This isn't my court. Here's what we're doing on a regular basis. We're coming to my house, and we're eating food. Here's what we're going to do on a regular basis. On a regular basis, you can show up to my house, and we're going to watch football games. And you begin to plant and say, here's what's going on. I'm not going to desire friends. I'm going to build friends. I'm going to build relationships because I value people. And because I value people, I'm going to choose to do things in such a way that we're going to spend life together. And you guys are all invited. We're going to have a big party. As a matter of fact, I'm going to throw an invitation open to you right now. At the end of this service, I say we all, like all 200 and something of us, go to Cold Stone's. And crash it like just big time. And everybody get in, like all 200 of us. We all fit inside there before they can lock the door at 9 o'clock. And then they have to serve us because we're in. They can't do anything about it. And then once we're all inside, somebody just start jumping. They'll be like, what is wrong with these people? And we'll just throw like this big party. Maybe somebody can throw off into some rap music. I don't know, whatever. It'll just be crazy good. But this is how you build friendships. This is how it works. You do something about it. You see, because I don't know if you're like me. Actually, that's not true. I know you're like me. I need people in my life. If I don't have people in my life, man, I get weird. I get really, really, really weird. 
If I don't have people in my life, I start making stupid, stupid decisions. Because I'm thinking, yeah, who's going to know? And then one of my friends slaps me upside the head and says, I'm going to know, stupid. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. If I don't have people in my life, I don't laugh. Because when you're with your friends, man, there's just something like somebody just says something stupid and you're just like, that's an open door, I'm going through it. You guys coming? And everyone's like, yep, we're coming. And then you just laugh. If I don't have friends, I get real uptight, get real edgy. And if I don't have friends, I don't relax. Because I love it when my buddies call me up and say, hey, Paul, let's go fishing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, fishing. I don't know if you understand fishing, but fishing is not about catching fish. It is just about being outside and just like sitting in a stream because you got waders up to here and you got water rolling and you're just hanging out with your buddies. And fishing is about the car drive and the ride home and the, and the stories. And it's about relaxing. You're going to say, hey, I went to church and learned about fishing. You see, then, then, then Solomon goes on and he says this. And, and what he's saying when he says this is he's saying, listen to me. Guys, I'm an old guy. I've been around the block a couple times. I know what I'm talking about. Don't choose things over people. Don't choose things over people. But so many times we get caught up in, in trying to have things. This is the case of a man who is all alone without a child or a brother. Yet, he works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, why am I working? What am, who am I working for? Why am I giving so much pleasure now? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depression, depressing. Things will never bring you the satisfaction you're looking for. People are way more important than things. You see, those things that I was talking about, about the friendship stuff, man, it's better to have poverty in your pockets than to have poverty in your soul. You see, because God's created us as souls, and then when two people connect, all of a sudden it's like, this is, this is it. This is what life is about. It's better to have laughter and friends than riches and loneliness. You see, and too many of us, we get caught up in the stuff, in, in the things I want you to catch this principle. Catch this. Write this down somewhere. If you continue to choose things over people, someday there will be no people to choose from. If you continue to choose things over people, someday there will be no people to choose from. I heard this story this guy told me this week about a friend of his that he had gone from high school together. They were both in their mid-50s. He said, my friend, my friend had lived his whole life with this one goal. I'm going to retire rich and I'm going to retire young. His whole plan was that by the time he hit 55 years of age, he was going to have enough money where he did not have to work for the rest of his life and he was just going to enjoy it. He was going to play, he was going to ski, he was going to do all these things. But at the sacrifice of trying to retire rich and trying to retire young, he denied his family family vacations. He denied his family family time because he worked all the time. He denied himself just stuff, just little pleasures. And on his 55th birthday, not on his 55th birthday, but when he turned 55, he retired. In six days after his retirement, he died of a heart attack. And he was telling this story. And, and, and he was just saying, you see, man, just make sure that you don't miss these times. Live in the moment. 
Do not miss these times. Don't choose things over people. Relationships are way more important. I love Proverbs 20, 27, and this is a paraphrased. It says, just as people will never stop dying and being destroyed, they will also never stop wanting more than they have. You see, we have this thing in our heart that says we don't have enough, but that we need more. And so what happens is we begin to chase more and more and more and more, and we do it at the expense of those around us. And, and, and Proverbs is saying, don't choose things over people. Things have the ability to give you pleasure. They do. What they do not have the ability to do is give you happiness. Riding motorcycles, a lot of fun. Ladies, buying clothes, a lot of fun, right? Jet skis, a lot of fun, right? Jet skis are a lot of fun. Cool cars are a lot of, lot of, lot of fun. But none of them are worth anything, and none of them are really any fun if you do not have friends to share them with, right? Have you ever just had a day off by yourself and, and you didn't have anything to do, so maybe you took the jet skis out to the lake and it was just you by yourself, and you go around the lake four or five times and you're like, hey, this is cool. About ten times going around the lake, you're looking for somebody else who you know on the beach because you're looking to have fun in relationship with somebody. And then he goes on to say this, and I love this. He says, so here's what you'd want to do. You want to have a successful life? Cultivate the friendships you have. Cultivate the friendships you have. Cultivate and protect your friendships. What he was really saying is this. You and I can't afford not to have friendships. Two people can accomplish more than twice as much as one. They get a better return for their labor. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But people who are all alone, when they fall, they're in real trouble. And on a cold night, two under the same blanket can gain warmth from each other. But how can one be warm alone? And a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two standing back to back can conquer. Three are even better, for a triple cord is not easily broken. You see, here's, 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 here's what's really cool. You need to know that marriage relationships, a lot of pastors will take this portion and they'll really begin to talk about marriage and they'll talk about the three um, braided cord and that you know part of that's your husband, your wife, and God and that the three of you together cannot be broken. And I believe that that's completely true. And I believe that there's a place for marriage relationships and that as a matter of fact, God created us with that in mind. But at the same time, there is something so fundamentally true about just having a good friend. That my wife is really cool, and, and me and my wife are best friends, and we, to, even, even today, I went home, and we were only going to get to see each other for about 10 minutes. And I said, you know what's really crazy, is we went out last night for Valentine's Day, and we went to the Thai restaurant up on Orchard Mesa. Side note story. We go in there, the little Thai lady looks at me, and she said, so did you buy your, um, she said, so did, did you buy your wife a present? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I got her some chocolate, and I got her a card. He said, well, did you buy her any flowers? I said, no, I, I didn't get her any flowers because I always get her flowers. She goes, you cheap. You cheap date. <laughs> I'm going back. I love that place. That's customer service right there. So she brings me out a flower and she, she says, look your, look your wife in the eye. Tell her you love her. And so I'm handed this and I'm afraid of this lady. And so I'm looking and I'm looking at the lady, and I'm handing it to my wife. And I'm going, sweetheart, I love you, because I think she's going to hit me. And she says, no, you look at your wife. Look at your wife, you bad husband. <laughs> okay, okay, it's all good. It's good. <laughs> but I told my wife, I said, you know what? Last night was great. We went out. We spent hours together. It was a great night. And I said, you know what? Yet today is a different day, and I needed time with you today. Because yesterday was gone. And so the marriage relationship is a relationship that God binds together. And, and that is a God-honoring relationship. But yet there are things that my wife will never be able to do in a relationship. That there are things that, that just happen that you need a friend for. Man, because I love being around guys that burp and, and scratch and tell jokes that you can't tell. 
around your wife. Just because she doesn't get the whole guy thing. You know? And, and that's, that's the whole thing. We're, we're at this, doing the Super Bowl thing, right? And, and the girls are trying to figure out if it's emerald green or forest green that the Seahawks wear. And I, all of a sudden, because of a good friend of mine, realized why they make sports bars. <laughs> Come on, guys. you got to defend me, right? But you know what? I know that there's also things that, for my wife, that as, as great as our relationship is, she just needs to go hang with the girls. She needs to go out to lunch. She needs to get her nails done. She needs to have a pedicure and a massage. And I'm thinking, that sounds horrible. Go do it. Go have fun if that's fun. Because we need friendships. We cultivate and protect our friendships. Do you know why? Because you are going to fall down. You are going to have days that you just are like, man, your knees are bloody because you just keep falling down all day long. You are going to have days where you get yourself into real trouble. And you need a friend. You're going to have days where you feel defeated and attacked. And you're going to have days where you need to know that somebody has your back. And that's your friend. I love it in Proverbs 27, 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. And that's why we cultivate and protect friendships. But I want you to get this. This isn't in the passage, okay? This is Paul Watson. This isn't a part of Solomon's passage. But this is just pastor perspective. You see, you need to cultivate friendships. But I want to tell you that true friends do not encourage bad behavior. You see, if you're cultivating friendships that encourage bad behavior, you're cultivating wrong friendships. You see, if you have friends who let you fall, you get the wrong friends. If you have friends who help you fall, you guys have had those friends, right? You're like, hey, I should do that. And that thing that you're saying I should do, you shouldn't be doing. And if your friends are sitting there going, yeah, let's go watch you do this. <laughs> go, you're going to fall. You got the wrong friends. If you have friends who make you fall, can I just ask you, what are you doing? If you have friends, that when you're with those friends, they make you fall and they make you further away from God than you know you're supposed to be. Can I just say, just as, just as pastor, what are you doing? Because you see, God has called us to have friendships that draw us closer to Him that make us more like him. Proverbs 20, 27 says, the godly walk with integrity. integrity. And not only do the godly walk with integrity, I believe the godly walk with people who have integrity. True friends lead you to be more like Christ. I'm going to close on this. I'm going to ask our worship team to come back up. You see, here is the value of a good life. Here is the value of a good life. That in your lifetime, you are going to choose to do things that serve eternity and humanity. That you're going to hang out and you're going to say, hey, what if we all got together and did this? Wouldn't that be great? You're going to choose big, hairy, audacious goals that say, you know what, God, I'm going to give you all my life. And we're going to do something really, really, really cool. And this is to honor you. Just focus on me. And you're going to choose to serve Christ with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And you're going to find some great buddies. And you're going to find some great buddies and you're going to hang on to these buddies and you're going to cultivate the friendships and you're going to protect the relationships and you're going to say, we are going to do life together. Whatever happens, here's what's going to happen. We're going to do life together. And just like Solomon said, hopefully you're going to find some good friends and you're going to make some decent money by working hard and living life honestly. And here's the key to life. At the end of your life, you want to know if you had a successful life. At the end of the day, when you die, 
you're going to have some great people standing around your funeral with tears in their eyes because you're gone. And that is the sign of good friendships, that you do friendships together, and when people aren't with you, that you miss them. And you cry out and you say, you know what, God? I need some friends like that. That's what I need. I need some friends that make me more like you, that encourage me towards right and not wrong. And we're going to finish up. We're going to do one last song. And, and, this is, and I asked him to kind of...